and welcome. I am Piers Ridiard, CEO of the Decentralized Finance Protocol, Radix, a public ledger entirely focused on bringing DeFi into the mainstream. This is our podcast, The DeFi Download, a show about decentralized finance and all things crypto, where we dive into the details of the products, assets, and services that are powering the DeFi revolution. Today, I am joined by Clayton, community lead at Yuma. Uma is a DeFi application that allows anyone to build decentralized finance products on chain. Clayton, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, Piers. Yeah, thanks. Really great to be here. So Uma's one of these projects that like a lot of people talk about because um, like it, in, in many interviews I've spoken about, some people like try out their first iteration of the of the product they're trying to build on uh Uma and um, like other people have built very successful businesses on it. So it'd be great if just from the context of what Uma is uh, in a little, little bit more depth and like what are the successful things that have been built using Uma sort of today? Absolutely. No, I think that's a great starting point. So Uma is a financial uh, products protocol, financial contracts protocol. And so people are able to build agreements uh, with other people on UMA that revolve around financial outcomes. And so typically the way that that works is somebody's going to lock up some collateral, they're going to agree on terms, and then over that period of time um, until kind of the expiration of that, then then at the expiration the, the terms would be sort of settled and the payouts would happen. So that's like a really broad level. And and, um, I would say that the range of projects that we've seen be successful on UMA have varied from lending products. So we've had a lot of traction with yield dollars, which are basically just what I described. It would be somebody um, designing a product around borrowing against a particular collateral um, and then allowing, yeah, allowing you to borrow against it, maybe, you know, do, do things with the funds elsewhere while you're borrowing. And then there's kind of a resolution and, and then everything goes back to, to level. Um, Otherwise, we've seen um, cool uses of our um, market settlement feature, which is basically an Oracle. We have a, an inbuilt Oracle system that is quite novel. It works quite a bit differently than others on the market. Um, Oracle being you know, just kind of the way that the blockchain learns about real world events. So we have that built into it. And so like another example of a product that just recently went out was um, Opium sold uh, insurance for the SpaceX rocket launch. And so basically, yeah, so you were able to actually um, either offer insurance and earn a premium or insure uh, the the rocket launch against mission failure based on certain criteria, whether the, the rocket couldn't take off, etc. And so you could see a product like that being useful for someone with the payload on that rocket. And so the role that UMA plays in that case is is like that's a market and the Oracle system that we have is able to ask the world, Hey, did the rock, like, well, how'd it go? How, what happened? Right. And then put that information back into the system and then, uh, settle those, those contracts. So that's kind of a, a, a broad answer for you. I don't want to go into like crazy amount of detail with the very first question. As, so, so I suppose the philosophy behind this is the idea that a most financial agreements are, trigger based so like we have we have an agreement between the two of us where money could flow either way an event occurs and if that event occurs then money should then the decision on how much and if and which direction right yeah um and you could describe that as you know sort of futures forwards um, you know, any kind of derivative. Uh, th- so there's a large number of ways in which you, that, that can sort of fall into the camp of financial agreements, right? Yeah, I think that's absolutely, absolutely right. Yep. How did that come about? Was, was the starting point of the team, hey, we want to build a particular financial product and to do that, we need to create a general framework or was it, we want to create a general framework because we think this is going to be really interesting? Sure, sure. Yeah, no, that's that's a cool question, and um, you know the UMA the the acronym stands for Universal Market Access, and so kind of the the long term vision here is the ability to offer permissionless access to any market in the world, and so we started out with this focus on synthetic assets, which basically would allow 
anyone in the world that can access Ethereum to participate in any market in the world or, or gain exposure to any market, right? It's not direct exposure. It's, it's what synthetic asset is, is it's an asset that tracks the value of an asset on another market. And right. so if you can create this system, you could allow, you, you can break down all this permissioned marketplaces we see around the world and allow anyone to participate and really just like level the playing field when it comes to investing and financial accessibility. Right. So that, like if I'm not in a based in America, buying Tesla stock is really difficult. Exactly. Right? Like, or, and there's lots of people who might want to own it, but getting exposure to it is difficult. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And of course, there are brokers around the world, but that's complicated. And they also don't service everywhere and they present their own problems. And they're also, uh, I believe, custodial um, as opposed to DeFi um, solutions. So that was kind of like the starting point. Um, I would say that we've, what was kind of interesting about that development, and this predates my joining the team, but I'm quite familiar with it, is that like we started looking for this Oracle solution and we didn't really find anything that was that was quite satisfying to what we wanted. Right. And so what Uma went ahead and did was wrote actually a second white paper and added this priceless Oracle to the system, which we call the Optimistic Oracle. And this was actually something theorized by Vitalik Buterin in 2014. He wrote an essay called Shelling Coin. And um, it's been kind of iterated a few times uh, in different versions over the years. But we've really arrived at something that's worked quite well. We've had, um, you know, in about a year on mainnet and up to over two hundred million dollars uh, secured by the by the contracts. Um, we've had like fewer than ten to twenty disputes. Um, generally, not terribly uh, outrageous ones. Meaning that, like, the the way that the oracle works, I won't go into super detail right now. But basically, it it just creates crypto economic incentives so that everyone behaves like they should. Um, it, and it make, means we don't need to push the price on chain every few moments. Um, so it's actually a lot less costly and it allows for dispute resolution. So right. that was kind of how we got into that part of the business as well. I mean, that, that was like people forget how big a problem set the, the Oracle problem like was um back in 20 2015 2016 when ethereum first started you people started building on ethereum um and in some ways still is right like the um the like the, the, the strengths and weaknesses of all of these and like i'd like i'd actually like to dive into this a bit because like any kind of incentive based oracle requires people to want to take the incentive in the first place right and if there's no one who's willing to take it you don't actually have an oracle feed but from the point of view of from the point of view of um the description of a financial contract that we've just described uh, as being like a trigger a trigger based event that decides the flow of money there's two ways that that can go wrong like generally speaking the first is the contract logic doesn't do what it's supposed to there's some kind of exploit or problem but the second is that the trigger event like feet is wrong in yep. some way right yep. and like if and if i if the amount of money that we're dealing with is a large amount of money and i don't like the fact that it went against me then i might want to work out a way of making sure that when the oracle comes in and says which way it went that it says it in my favor even if the actual real world events weren't in my favor yep. um which is like always been the thing that people have been like ah but this is the oracle problem that the off ledger data to on ledger data problem is 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 intrinsically the attacking the oracle might be way less expensive than attacking the contract or the consensus. Yeah. Um, so, how did you guys solve it? What does what's the Uma Oracle? Sure. No, that's uh, that's actually a really wonderful framing of that. I don't think I've heard it quite so succinctly. So uh, that's cool, and um, I think is a great layup <laughs> to to basically the Uma approach. So um, essentially, we. We use crypto, we use economic guarantees. And essentially what that means is that um, we basically make sure that it's always going to be more expensive to bribe the Oracle than the amount of money you could steal. And so the other way to say that is like you wouldn't spend $80, or sorry, you wouldn't spend $100 to steal $80. And right. so the way that this works with UMA is that token holders, um, who are the ones that obviously own the token and have financial exposure to the value of UMA, 
they are the ones who adjudicate disputes. And so the way that the Oracle is designed is that it will only secure up to half of the total market cap of the UMA token, right. at which point it would start charging fees and, and run through a buyback process. But before that time, let's just assume that the, the total value secured is under half. Um, essentially, you would need to spend more money than you could possibly steal to, to convince UMA token holders to basically throw the protocol under the bus and drive the token value somewhere close to zero because it failed um, in order to, to lie to the Oracle. And so that's really the premise of how this works is that, um, yeah, those, those economic guarantees. That, that sounds like the risk of the Oracle is essentially held in common by all UMA token holders. So like any single event could, if, if it goes the wrong way, could end up meaning that me as a token holder... I can get slashed for any of the events that the, the, the Oracle is, is guaranteeing. Is that true or not? Not quite. I wouldn't phrase it quite like that. What I would say is okay. that token holders... Um, so if, if there's a dispute, which like I said, are, are actually quite rare, you... So what, what would an example... Of, like, So let, let's take the happy case first mm -hmm. and then let's talk about what a dispute would look so like. So like, how does a happy pace occur? Because you said that this is a um, a... You called it a, was it a priceless oracle? Yeah, or a, yeah, or optimistic yeah. oracle was is the an optimistic oracle. So, um, let's say that you and I have are, are betting for the next week on the price of Tesla. I think mm -hmm. it's going to be above what it is today. You think it's going to be below what it is today. It's a fifty fifty bet. We both put twenty dollars in, and at the end of it, we'll get a payout of forty, depending on whether or not it's above or below. Right. Yep. So, in a week's time, what actually happens? Like. Sure. So, so yeah, I'll describe the happy case. So let's say that the price of, I, I actually forgot who staking which side, but let's say the price went up. I'm, I'm, I'm going up, okay. you're going down. So the price went up, right? And so it went up from where it is today. And the happy case is that there's going to be requests sent to the Oracle saying, hey, what's the price of Tesla? Um, or, or it could say like, hey, did the price go up? Um, and in the happy case, someone's going to submit a response. They're going to post a bond, and they're going to submit a response. Anyone can do this. You can do this. I can do this. Now, I have to post a bond in order to do this, so I have some exposure. Now, there's going to be a liveness period, which is typically two hours, but the, the, whoever's designing this contract can, can customize that, where anyone could dispute that, and the, the disputer would, would have to post a bond. But we're, we're talking about the happy case. So what's going to happen is... Uh, Nobody is going to dispute it. After two hours, it's going to go ahead and close, and then the payouts are going to be made. So you're going to the forty dollars will be paid to you, and that's the end of it. That's the happy route. So basically, someone else for a fee because they're going to earn a fee for 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 giving the price will will go. Okay, I've checked. I've checked personally that the price is above the price that uh, that 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 it was a week ago. Right. So. Prices above trigger event occurs, and I put a bond against that to say, "Hey, I'm guaranteeing that that is actually correct." Yep. Um, and then the pay the payout happens, mm -hmm. and there's this two two hour period to debate it. And I suppose the point of that is is I could you could post the bond. Yes, you could you could decide. Well, actually, I'm because the ledger has no idea of what the Tesla price is. So you could go. Clayton can be like, "Well." I would like to get my 40 bucks. So I'm going to post the bond and I'm going to say that the Tesla price is below um, what it was a week ago. Mm -hmm. So what happens then? So what happens if, uh, if, if basically I was to dispute that despite it being correct? That's the... No, if you, if you posted the initial bond with the wrong Oracle information. Gotcha. Okay. So in that event, there would be a financial opportunity for anyone. You even more so, but nevertheless, anyone at all. And that's what's nice. It's you aren't the only one that can dispute this. To come in and say, wait, that's wrong. Um, the, and so this person would post a bond as well. And they have the opportunity to win both bonds if they're, um, or you know, get their bond returned and win the, the submitter's bond. At that point, that's when it goes to the token holders to say, okay, guys, like, now is, is, uh, the time where you like you need to um, you know decide what was the real outcome here, and it's kind of like your your token holder your token value is on the line in this regard, 
And so, you know, unless you can really muster hundreds of millions of dollars to bribe these people to just throw a UMA token un under the bus, which you're probably not going to do for 40 bucks, um, they're going to give the outcome. Not the money, it's the principle. It's the principle, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I I sort of laugh at that one and it's like kind of true, right? Like crypto economic guarantees only work if you're like rational and don't want to just throw a million hundreds of millions of dollars down the drain. Um so yeah, assuming yeah, assuming that you're uh exactly profit motivated, um then yeah, that's how that would resolve. They would they would go ahead and submit the correct answer. There's inflation rewards associated with that with participating. You know, we tend to have like a 30 to 40% participation rate as far as tokens participating goes, um, which is That's pretty, good. pretty good. Yeah. And so, and, you know, I would imagine too, if something was particularly contentious, people would talk about it a lot and we'd get higher rates. Um, but, but yeah, so that, that's how that would resolve the, um, the price would come back accurately. Uh, the, the disputer, the you or whoever disputed my, um, attempt to get, to get one past everyone would, uh, would gain the, the bond from me. So I would lose that. Um, as well as lose, you know, lose the bet, the, the money would be sent to you. Quite right too. <laughs> um, and so from like, this is a really interesting, it's a really interesting system with a bunch of really interesting, like game theory, um, aspects to it. Um, why is, why is this better or why is this the approach that Uma has decided to go rather than just going, well, let's use chain link. Yeah, I think that's a really important question because um, it, I don't think it's apparent. I, like, I don't think it's apparent yet in the conversation we've had why this is better. It's better. It's better because it's like you don't need to put the price on chain all the time. That's nice. We're we're just using the way that I like to phrase it is that we don't. You don't need to actually put the price on chain all the time if you can make people behave as though it were. And so that's what Uma, this design is able to do. But I would say what's actually better is not really the malice case. It's actually kind of the error case. And so what happens with, um, with, uh, with a price feed kind of oracle is that, you know, that price gets pushed on chain and, and liquidations happen immediately and there's no recourse. And so a really straightforward example, uh, historical example for this was that, um, um, the price of Dai on Coinbase went up to $1.30 for a short period of time several months ago. And it triggered, I think, $80 million of liquidations on Compound. And it, it had to do with the way that Compound was grabbing the, the price from, from um, Coinbase. And that's the kind of case where like, there's, there's, no, there's nothing you can do. You, like the, the liquidations have already been settled. Everyone kind of... Money's gone. Yeah, the money's gone, you know. And so that's kind of the case where like we've seen this in traditional finance quite a lot where people make mistakes or things kind of go sideways and wrong and there's recourse and that's actually like yeah we don't like the fact that people can turn back time in traditional finance of course um and that's something we want to move away from um but at the same time like there's a really good purpose for being able to do that and so it's really the dispute the dispute resolution and the opportunity that like two hour window, basically, it's like, hey, here's the piece of information. Here's a window of time we can sanity check it, and then the money's gone. You know, we we provide that little delay in there, um, and that delay doesn't exist for everyone. Meaning that like most things, most things are able to to transact just fine without a big delay. It's at the market resolution point, um, but like yeah, it, it just provides that uh, that window of opportunity, and so if if Compound had been using Uma's solution, like we could either imagine there would be a delay for li liquidations so that they would have to wait a little while for that sanity check. Um, or you could actually imagine some sort of party that ensures that so the liquidator could withdraw immediately, but there's someone else ensuring that two window period as another way it could play out. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, that's kind of why Uma's went with this, went with this design. Um, Uma was founded by ex Goldman Sachs people who have quite a lot of experience in the TradFi world and, you know, trading hundreds of millions of dollars and doing this kind of stuff and seeing how these things can go wrong. Um, and yeah, I think, I think there's a fair number of exploits and just accidents that we see in DeFi that we are sort of kind of thinking are just status quo. They're the way that things go. This is finance, there's risk, et cetera. Um, but I think that's wrong. 
I think there is actually, I think we actually could be preventing um, some of these problems that we're having if we were using a, an optimistic uh, resolution plus, plus, plus a dispute mechanism. I suppose there's another benefit as well, though, which is, is that you don't actually have to establish a data feed. Uh, as in, someone has to have a way of accessing the data, but like on Chainlink or actually almost any Oracle that reports the information on Ledger, um, you have to go through quite a lengthy process of validating the data feeds, make sure that you have multiple data feeds, all of this kind of stuff, which makes it quite difficult to do something ad hoc, right? Like yep. the rocket launch example is a great one. Like Chainlink's not going to be doing an Oracle anytime soon on SpaceX launches, but this is this is flexible enough to allow you to do the the edge case scenario, which is really interesting in finance because actually there's like this, there's this whole concept of um, exchange versus OTC, which a lot of people don't realize how big OTC is versus exchange. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's multiple times bigger. And OTC meaning over the counter is when you go to a, when you go to an institution, you say, Hey, I want this specific thing. It isn't a standard product. I need you to create it for me and I'm willing to pay you to do that. Um, and that that's actually the majority of finance. Mm -hmm. The the minority of finance is the trade is the, is the is the exchange traded finance. Sure. And this 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 approach allows a huge degree of flexibility in that. Um, so let's talk about the ways it's gone wrong. You say there's been several disputes. What were the what were the natures of the disputes and like how and 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 how did they end up resolving? Sure. Like, I'd love to know some of the contentious ones if you have some. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and I actually want to touch on something you said just now as well, which is um, you're absolutely right about the the matter of securing those those price feeds. Um, what's cool with with Uma's design is like we do need a price feed to like check on the price frequently, but the price feed doesn't need to be strong enough to resist manipulation. And so what that means is like uh, you know, for instance, the 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 rocket launch or whatever. Basically, if someone tried to manipulate it. The source of information just needs to be public, meaning like we just need to be able to say, okay, this is probably wrong. Let's go see what the truth is. Let's take a moment. We have some time. Let's go look at what the truth is. And as long as like as long as there's a real world status to investigate, uh, you know, like physically whether the rocket is, you know, here or there or in good shape. Uh, yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, <laughs> I think it was successful. Um, I can't see it anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of a funny case actually. Um, uh, so yeah, that that's what I would say is is you're absolutely you, you really nailed kind of a a, fe a a feature of that. So to get to this contentious, I'll try to think of the most contentious one. But for the most part, actually, I wouldn't say that there have been any that were um, that were like one person saying like, oh, you liquidated a million bucks and you shouldn't have. We just really haven't seen that for the most part. Like I think half of them have just been someone testing, like just seeing if it worked. Like somebody was willing to just throw away a couple bucks to put in a dispute, so we all voted, etc. Um, most of the time, what what we see is just the when there's an expiry, um, you know, and, and to token holders need to come on there to to issue a um, to to kind of adjudicate the market to say this was the expiration price. But that was even before we switched to the optimistic model. So now we don't even have that token holder vote. We just have one person propose it. And then there's the dispute period. Um, ultimately, I would say that what we did have was like, so, so basically when you're using these liquidations and disputes system for um, under capital, or not under capitalized assets, but for assets that can become under collateralized, um, you do have bots that are set up to dispute. So that, that role I told you about where you post a bond, you make a dispute. We did have a, like a problem where the bots went a little wonky and like made some disputes when they shouldn't have. And that was just right. like, you know, that's kind of just like, well, we're, we're not following our own economic incentives at that point. Right. Cause we're paying money when clearly the answer was not wrong, but we're saying it's wrong. And so like that was, that happened. Um, but we really haven't had any like big fights or any big, you know, people, um, uh, questioning whether there was a liquidation, you know, and we've had, you know, several hundred thousand dollars liquidations at different times. 
Um, and you know, it's just what happens when you're borrowing assets and the value of your collateral falls. And so we don't have people showing up and getting upset about it or otherwise disputing it. Um, the economic guarantees really have worked the way you would have expected them to thus far. Sorry, there's not a more exciting answer though. How, how dull a <laughs> system that works. Um, a, uh, one of the things that strikes me and like, I suppose it's not, it's, it, it's like, uma has been around for a while, right? When did you guys start? Well, we went on mainnet, um, just a little bit over a year ago, but they were kind of in the R and D phase for two years before that. Um, right. yeah. Right. And, and so there was this, there was this, um, when, when DeFi first started or when like finance on Ethereum first started, let's not call it DeFi, the, most of the ways in which you model financial products was, was just a direct copy of what you got in the traditional finance like setting. You'd just be like, okay, it is discrete financial products with a one-to-one relationship between two counterparties, right? Uh, or two or several counterparties. Whereas what DeFi has become, in my view, is this concept of aggregated or pooled risk. Again, so it's it's a one-to-many relationship where I am a liquidity provider in a pool on Compound, Aave, Uniswap, that finds a market price for that risk as a result of the pooling mechanic and the demand for use of those assets. That this model seems to not work quite so well for like this idea of like pooled financial products with a market-based risk against you know to, for, for like repeatable products um like would you say that's true or or is there something is there an extra aspect to this that i'm missing um so just to clarify you're, are you asking me if it's true that um the traditional financial model doesn't work as well for these this pooled design the yeah yeah yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that makes sense. The the pooled design is interesting because it also means that you have pooled exposure, pooled risk. You know, so certain types of whether it's you know an oracle exploit or a smart contract risk, etc., um, across different assets. So that gets a little bit interesting. Um, and I think different platforms handle that differently. In Uma's case, um, each contract is separate, so um, there wouldn't you know if, if one of them were to become undercapitalized, it wouldn't affect any others. Um, but I think that it's kind of the secret sauce behind decentralized finance working. I mean, essentially, a bank works that way where they have all these different pooled, uh, you know, I mean, their, their balance sheet is all one big pool, right? And they're, they're pulling from it and borrowing and lending and, the, and, and everything kind of comes down to the same sums at the bottom of the page. Um, right. And so I see it as the same, the same with finance on Ethereum is just we are able to work together to become this, this bank type feature. Um, and pool our assets and have all that efficiency associated with it. Um, so I think it's a really cool thing, definitely. I'm not sure if that answers your so, question, but I like it. So from the point of view of like, you know, I, I can build Aave using Uma, right? As in, I can I can yeah. build I could build a a a system that would allow me to lend out my Ethereum for a fee, or or vice versa, borrow Ethereum for a fee. Um, what what is the what is the reason that people would prefer to use something like Aave over Uma for that? Sure. Like what, like what, what, what's characteristically different and what are you seeing the reasons that people choose Uma as the, as the place that they do their borrowing or lending versus using one of the, you know, Aave or compound or something. Similar? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that something like Aave is designed to be very focused on that particular use case. And so they focus a lot on the UI. They focus a lot on, really delivering that product quite well. And, and, um, so I think that like, I think it kind of just has to do with like what's already built and what's ready to be used. Um, you know, we haven't necessarily focused on that particular use case. So we do have developers that have built out, like I mentioned, the, the yield dollar products, what those allow you to do is rather than actually kind of putting, locking your ether and borrowing USDC from somebody, what you do in our case is lock your ether and mint um, these yield dollars and then swap them for USDC. And the effect is the same. It actually allows you to have um, a fixed APY instead of a variable. Um, 
and and and, and so the the end game is you can you can gain leverage or spend or spend your your USDC without or die or any other stables without um, losing exposure to ETH. But the reason that that hasn't taken off, I think, just has to do with where our focus is. Um, and uh, the other is because like we have not put a lot of emphasis on the perpetual. Um, we, we basically focus on expiring products right now, which we can talk about mm -hmm. a bit more. But basically, like the yield dollar products expire, and that doesn't create the best UX because essentially it means that you know if you wanted to take on a, a year or two year position, you 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 probably have to come in and like roll. So like that means like sell your exposure in one and buy the mm -hmm. next, etc. And so you know people don't typically want that kind of experience when it comes to borrowing. Um, right. So Instant that's access, withdraw anytime, and I get a yield as long as I'm exposed. Yeah. And, you know, people want the set it and forget it thing. And so even with the expiring model, like I said, we could we could have put our emphasis on the, the perpetual side if, if that's where our focus was. With the expiring model, yeah, people can't set it and forget it in the same way. Um, so I would say that's why that use case, like, you know, we, we're going to leave it to the, to the guys that are kicking butt right now. Um, however... What's pretty cool about UMA is like we have this optimistic oracle that Ave could plug into and start using it without using our contracts. They can just call the optimistic oracle on the occasion of a dispute. Um, so that oracle service is available for anyone to use um, and still maintain kind of their functioning, their pools functioning, et cetera. So who is who is currently using the optimistic oracle service in DeFi? So the first one that I mentioned was Opium um, that that did with that the rocket launch product. Um, then we have like a number of partners that are building on us right now. Can I just ask why was it a mar it, like sounds like a marketing stunt for just like demonstrating what their product is, but sure. because, but like what, what is their actual product? Well, so opium offers insurance and options. Um, a lot of yeah, insurance project products. Um, so like the actual motivation for it was, to offer an insurance product that doesn't really exist, or I think it exists at a different rate. I think you can actually insure it, but um, to some degree, yeah, it's just cool. Like it's really cool. Like think about this, peers. Like I can sell insurance on a rocket launch. Like it's not even just like oh, I can buy place a bet on a rocket launch or something like that. Like I went from being forced to buy insurance on my car to being allowed to sell insurance on a rocket ship. It's just like just that to go from here to here is just incredible to me. Um, so like you could call it a marketing stunt um, and maybe it is to a degree, but I think it's just like a really good proof of concept for um, what's cool about DeFi and some of the potential that we have to go. Now in an ideal world, the guys with payloads with those satellites would buy that insurance, right? They would use it to help hedge their risk. Um, actually getting to that point where they like, know what the product is, they feel comfortable with it, they trust it, et cetera. Like that takes, that takes a lot of the human work. Like just because the contract is there doesn't mean everyone's going to use it. We need to do all the, the education, the marketing, et cetera, to get to that point. Um, so I would say it's a mix, both things, to answer your question. Oh, this is really interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, and let's, let's, uh, let's talk about sort of token holders and and engagement like mm -hmm. i think out of any of the projects that i've spoken to uh uma has a a, a recurring requirement for engagement right so like how have you guys built a system that make sure that happens and you don't have this like half life of interest and then like engagement dwindles out over time and like sure. How do you how do you create a community around engagement in settling disputes is one of the primary ones, but there's got to be more to it than 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 that for the for the project. Yeah, there there's basically two things going on simultaneously with regard to engagement, which I can talk about. So the first is what you what you mentioned here, which is the the voting participation for disputes, and then the second is actually just being a part of the community and helping helping increase adoption and helping to explain these products to people. So in the first case, there's just this economic incentive. And so every time there's a vote, there's a there's a 0.05% token inflation. So I'm saying like 1 20th of 1% uh, of the total token supply gets minted by the protocol. 
and automatically distributed to everyone who participated in that vote, proportional, proportional to their token holding. And so what you can imagine is happening mm. here is anyone who doesn't participate is effectively being diluted. And so they, right. it, it's as much, you know, it's as much a carrot as a stick um, to where, right. yeah, you, it's really meant to be like, hey, the purpose of this token is not for you to like watch number go up or worry about that. It's, it's to, to actually participate. And so um, that's, that's kind of a motivator, right? So like if, if, you, if you had a lot of them, you would want to participate and make sure that that wasn't happening to you. Um, so I think that that helps a lot, right? There is that, that piece of it. And we, we do also offer gas rebates, incidentally, like we, every month we pay out comp, uh, anyone who's, who voted successfully, um, we compensate them for their gas because it is on chain voting and gas fees, of course, can get insane. Um, and that would disproportionately hurt smaller holders. So we did, we did want to prevent that happening. Um, so that's one way, you know, and then it, it, but it takes some work peers. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, we put out announcements, we try to remind people that there's votes, you know, people are busy. And so it's, it is interesting in the long run, the tokens are going to have to slowly flow towards people who have whatever it takes to be participating members because they're the ones who experience the most value from it. It's not terribly, I mean, you like, but the thing I would instant my mind instantly goes to is two things. First is I would build I would want to build some kind of script that like voted for me. Sure. And the second is that's difficult because every single vote could be on a completely different thing. Um so gathering the right information for it could be difficult. Sure. Um and of course like we wouldn't want it to get too automated because the purpose is that when there's a dispute you take a look at it. Um, right. Disputes are getting very rare. So um, because of the optimistic design, or sorry, they've always been rare, but the actual uh, requirement to vote in a price expiry is getting rarer and rarer. Otherwise, what we also vote on is like adding new collaterals, adding new price identifiers, um, changing the protocol. All of those things require a vote as well. Um, so yeah, you would want to automate it. But at the end of the day, like we do want, we at least want that feature to be there whereby like, it's almost like, yeah, things are kind of running as expected. You can kind of come vote and just chat with people and find out what the vote is supposed to be. But we want to make sure people are engaged enough that it's like, hey, this is a real thing. We, we really need to sit down and figure out what went on here and sort it. And so like, it's important that people aren't literally turning on a script and like never seeing anything about it, right? Like, um, and we've, you know, the design is to prevent that. Uh, right, right, and the only time that you're supposed to vote is when there's a dispute. Yeah, or one of these upgrades. Or oh, one of these upgrades, and you're saying you know thir thirty to forty percent vote participation over over how many votes is that? Oh, we've had hundreds of votes. Um, well, so so uh, sorry, like a lot of what we do is with like the upgrades, for example, we we bundle them uh, one time per week, essentially, and so okay. we typically have a vote per week in that way. And then there can be a dispute at any time. Um, but that, like I said, they're, those are pretty rare. So you could say on average one a week or maybe um, maybe five a month at this point. That's really, that's really interesting. Uh, and then on the other side, like you, you, one of the things you were mentioning to me before was uh, Dow Treasury Management. Yeah. I, I'd love to hear a bit more about that because it's a hot topic right now. Yeah, absolutely. So just to connect it back to what we were talking about before, right? Like with the, with the idea of financial contracts. So we have, you know, we have this idea of a trigger. We have these different parties that want to get together and make this deal. And so like, I think when people hear that, they think of that peer-to-peer -peer setup. And that's the example you and I gave, this $40 bet on Tesla. Um, but actually, you can just as which well... Which I won. Yeah, which you did win, I realize. <laughs> I'll have to get you yeah, I'll, I'll have to get you later. Um, I hope you accept me my tokens. Um, I, I, absolutely. Very good. Uh, so, so yeah, like that peer-to-peer that -peer side is one way to do that. But the other way to do it is um, you know, to create products that, that are that are that are tradable and composable and you know DeFi friendly and so like this isn't only peer-to-peer -peer. i mean these are these are products in the the way that we understand with DeFi. and so what what uma is doing right now so you can write financial contracts that would allow basically part economic parties to, to cooperate even in places where there's not an effective governmental system to ensure like um meat space contracts 
And that's what's really exciting about UMA. It's overwhelmingly broad. So like, there's just like so many things you can do with it that people can come to us and just be like, you know, like, I don't know what to do. Um, and so we're, we're sort of testing a few different approaches of like actual products to demonstrate and to, to, to gain, to kind of, to, to gain understanding. And so what we're focusing on right now and what seems to be getting a lot of positive response is, is DAO treasury management tools. And so for example, we have uh, KPI options, which are a product that basically allows you to take some of your, your DAO's tokens, um, lock them up and offer these KPI option tokens to any one you want, but let's say your community and say, Hey guys, if we can achieve this level of volume on our AMM, or this level of TVL on our loan lending platform, then these options will be worth more of this underlying token. And so by giving them out to people, you provide this incentive for them. So that's one tool that we have. Another one that we're offering is called range tokens. What those are is more of a um, fundraising or even borrowing against your own token tool. And what that allows you to do is um, create these range tokens, which will expire um, at some date in the future, um, at a value based on the value of, of the DAO's token. If if it falls within a range, so in Uma's, I think Uma is like around nine bucks right now, and so we we actually launched a, a token, um, a range token, and I think we made the range from four to twelve dollars. If it expired, the to, the the prices between that range, it'll be worth a dollar. Otherwise, a dollar of UMA. Otherwise, if it's over that range, you're basically exposed to a call option on UMA. And so you're going to receive a fixed amount of UMA, but your upside would increase. And then it's the same way you're also exposed to a put option, so that if it expires under $4, you're going to have a little bit of a, uh, your APY would be a little less. This sounds a little bit complicated. It, it takes a few times to wrap your head around exactly. But essentially, it, it ends up being this really great compromise behind, but between like uh, a DAO being able to raise funds and diversify its treasury, and offer this cool product, which which in a lot of cases might just translate to a nice healthy yield for for buyers, um, but and also allow the DAO to not way undersell or oversell its um, its token. You know, like we don't want to uh, sell everything too cheaply or to, or or um, actually, that's the main thing, right? From a DAO's perspective, right? Um, right. So you have a fixed fixed supply of 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 treasury that you need to maximize the amount of of upside that you can create in the system, sure. and you can sell too much of it too soon or not enough of it to get yeah. So yeah, for sure, um, I think it's really interesting from a. To me, this is this is sort of looking more towards the future of what these financial communities are and what they mean. Yeah. Um, but from a like KPIs and uh, OKRs, uh, objective key, uh, uh, objectives and key results, mm -hmm. or you know key, key performance indicators, traditionally used as, as as business management tools within organizations to help the team understand what the goals of the of the org is and now we're moving into the decentralized autonomous organizations dao model where the community is part of the team they're part of the things that are making it happen and yep. being able to create a more concentrated what i like to call pointy mm -hmm. I, like, I like to call pointy vision on like or focused if you will um on what it is that you actually want to achieve and what you think is important and then having a way in which the community is actually um, benefits from hitting that, yep. I think, is definitely where we're going. It's a, uh, it, it's a really interesting, it's really interesting. Again, really interesting game theory yep. idea of how to create incentivized communities around the, uh, the the objectives of a of a of a of a group of people. Yep. So um, it's been wonderful having you, Clayton. If people want to learn more about Uma. Um, where do they go uh, and where would you recommend like getting started? What's the first thing that you, you say, if you want to, you know, get started with Uma, this is what you start with. Sure. Sure. I mean, it's hard for me not to just say that come and chat with us. Like the discord is really where everything's happening. Um, okay. So discord.umaproject.org will take you there. Okay. 
Um, there's a few different routes to get started. Like we have this KPI option program has led to a group of what we call super humans, who are the ones that are hustling to make this KPI get hit. You can join us there and earn pretty sizable upside, to be honest. I won't just say what that is here, but it's pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you could also just want to participate as a buyer. Like you could participate in gaining exposure to some of the synthetic assets and the different products available. Um, or yeah. you can be a builder and you want to come build something neat with Uma, um, all of which is welcome. I'm proud to say that I think we have something cool for everyone to do. So anyone listening to this that says like, oh, I'm not a developer, I'm not an investor, whatever. Actually, if you show up, like you're going to find something cool to do if you want to hang out, uh, hang out with uh, passionate nerds. We miss the place to do it. Clayton, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks, Pierce. It was great. Mm-hmm.